Hello everyone, I'm Renee Lobo and welcome to the Renee Lobo Report, bringing issues of topical interest. Tax filing is just around the corner. It's going to be this year, Tuesday, April 17th. So we have not too much time left and uh, these days we live in a global world, so we have transactions globally. So you have to, if you have stocks, finance, foreign bank accounts, uh, saving accounts, any account outside of the U.S., that too has to be also filed. And there's some that have been filed along with your IRS tax returns, which is going to be April 17th, some that is NRI filing, which is going to be filed on July 31st. And then there are others like uh, the FBAR, the Foreign Bank Account Report, which will be filed on June 30th. So these are your three significant dates that need to be put out in your calendar so you know that these are the days that you have to file your tax returns. And today we have a panel of experts. They are very uh, much, their expertise is in tax filing, and we have CPS, chartered accountants, as well as an attorney going to tell us all about some misconceptions we may have about filing tax returns, NRI filings, as well as offshore voluntary compliance. So joining me today, we have with us uh, Cecil Nazareth. He's a chartered accountant and a CPA uh, with a tax firm of IF. RS Partners, and that's um, in, uh, where is it, in Manhattan? In Manhattan. In Manhattan. So thank you, Cecil, for joining us. Melinda Fellner Bromwit, she's a tax attorney, and uh, she's done a lot of cases, FBAR cases, over 25 of them, and as well as offshore voluntary compliance. So she's going to tell us all about from the legal perspective. And Melinda Bromwit is from the law firm of Norris McLaughlin and Marcus. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Melinda for coming here today yeah. and joining us as well we have Vinay Navani he is a CPA thank you very yes. much uh, Vinay for joining us again now you know, we have a lot of misconceptions about uh, tax filings especially if they're overseas you know and if I am a green card holder if I'm a citizen what's my immigration status has nothing to do with this or or it has to do with it. So tell us, first of all, Cecil, I'm going to talk to you about this. Some misconceptions, if you can clarify for us. Sure. Renee, thank you for having us. And there's a common misconception that U.S. citizens, uh, we think that we are emigrated to the U.S., so we have no other tax responsibilities. U.S. citizens, residents, green card holders, and, some, and another category is called physical presence test. Emigration status has nothing to do with tax filing status. So if you... Uh, you know, you're on HB1 visa, for example. That also has nothing to do with the status. So our issue is the tax status is totally independent of an immigration status. And I joke sometimes, Rene, you could be illegal, but you might still have to owe tax to the U.S. government. So keep that in mind. The main focus here is if you have uh, people of Indian origin, you focus on the India assets uh, right. side first. So you have three major deadlines. U.S. citizens are taxed on worldwide income, period. And so once we get that concept out of the way, then the second, we have three filing deadlines. So the first filing deadline is April 17th, that is for the U.S. tax return. The second is July 31st, is for the Indian tax return. That year end is March 31st. And then finally, you'll have the FBAR, which is June 30th. Right. But I recommend to everyone, if you don't have your ducks in a row, you're better off just filing for an extension, individual extension, which goes all the way to October. And we will pick on, on that topic a little later on in the session. Uh, you can also uh, do an extension for the NRI filing? Yes, you know, in the India side. In the India okay, side but well. I, I recommend you get your facts together. That becomes a real issue, getting your information and really having So that immigration status has nothing to do with your tax returns. That's tax a very return. important uh, point that a lot of people might Absolutely. think because they have some transactions in India as well. Absolutely. And I'll add to that, Renee, also you get tax credit. People forget that. Mm -hmm. So if you, there's no double taxation on income. So if right. you get taxed in India... You're very, you bring that income back to the U.S., you add it to your U.S. tax return and get a tax credit for the tax. But you need your documents. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Now, what if you don't get your documents on time? No, you have an extension, so okay. you you got right. six months' time to file in the U.S. So I'd, I'd recommend, Renee, start with the India side because that's the foreign side of it. Right. Because you need to take the credit in the U.S. Start with the India side, comply, and then bring it back. So with the NRI filing, you need a PAN number or something? Yes, yes. The three important things you've got to apply is called a permanent account number. It's 14, Form 49, and we, we have a solution where we can deliver it, but you can do it electronically or manually. Right. You need a PAN number to report on your tax return. If not, the tax authorities in India will not be able to figure out what you're actually doing. The date is July 31st, I said, to comply. Their tax year end is March, as I've reemphasized. 
And we also have a service because I came across a lot of disconnects. So I, we are offering a service where we can file both returns, the India return and the U.S. return in an integrated, I call it one-stop shopping. Yeah, because a lot of times uh, some, those those are filing for you, helping you with the that's tax right. filing, that's right. may not be cognizant about the, you know, stuff that's, that's going on in India or overseas. So you do for both. We, we can do both. I see. And so the main factor here is, the, the, the U.S. account in the CPA sometimes does not understand the, U, uh, the CA complexities in India, and the CA in India does not understand the U.S. complexities. So that's where we are having that difficulty and disconnects. So we can integrate that I see. Uh, seamlessly. And, and we have another slide, which is about the non-resident of India tax purposes that yes. we have. Let's, let's go to yes. That now, one. this is a very important slide. And like we mentioned before, the status, uh, immigration status has nothing to do with this. I get at least 60% of my calls on immigration status, and should I file a return? Or not file a return. Now the residency factor comes into being, and now I'm talking of residency on the India side, folks, not on the US side, on the India side. So if you are a resident of India for 182 days or 60 days in a tax year, then you're pretty much you're considered an Indian resident. So be very careful. My golden advice to all my clients, keep track of your visits to India. Because okay. either the second criteria is also you have to look at the previous nine years. I don't know. I've been here 30 years. Which means years like today. if you're almost living in India for six months in a year. Yes. Yes. You can very well be taxed in India on your worldwide income. That's Even right. if you're a U.S. citizen? Even if you're a U.S. citizen. So that becomes a hairy point here. And that's why I clarify residency is going to become absolutely critical. So you need to keep track of your visits to India. And starting April 1st of 2012, they have got some new guidelines where they are trying to enforce it. So far, they have not enforced the residency uh, to the best of my knowledge on the India side. You know. Now, let me add to that. They have the U.S. residency side also, where you might look at the residency, whether you're a resident of the U.S. Right, right. Uh, U.S. or not. And you need to evaluate both sides. First, figure out which country is are you a resident of, and then the tax will follow that. So my, going back to those 182 days that yes. we're talking about, I'm a U.S. citizen, but I, I'm in India for 182 days. Absolutely. As a person who's working over there or right. for business trips or something, correct. I still have to file in India. That's correct. And in the United in States the then? In the U.S. Right? But you will get something called a foreign tax exclusion. Okay. Uh, and Vinay might uh, know, uh, you know, what might clarify some of this. If your earned income, it has a different threshold. Certain amount is excluded from your income, but you still have to file the return. And so, my golden advice, even if you don't qualify on the threshold limits, my golden advice to the clients is file a return so it documents compliance, hmm. and that's a very important takeaway. Yeah, climb, compliance is very, very important. Absolutely. Otherwise, we get into major Absolutely. issues here. Uh, Bin, I want to come back to you on sure. for, F bar foreign bank account reports, and that's form TD F nine zero. Dash two two point one. Yes, I can never remember that name, so <laughs> we just call it the F bar, Report of Foreign it's Bank Accounts. It's easier much, that much way. easier yeah. to say F bar. So the F bar is a form that's been around for a long time. Right. Okay. But it got. It, it got a lot of. Um, high, last year. High, last year. Uh, uh, it, it's last year it got an extra boost, but a right. few years before that it got in two thousand nine mm -hmm. it got right. a lot of attention too. So it was originally part, set up to help the Department of Treasury. Um, look for money laundering and money-related crimes. Right. It never had anything to do with the tax law. And that's why so many CPAs, CAs, so many people for many years didn't even really know about the form or focus on the form. But in you know, 2009, 2008, when all this Swiss banking um, scandals emerged, when, right. when it became clear that a lot of Americans had money overseas, everybody started looking at the F-bar and put a renewed effort on the F-bar. So now the F-bar is really a high-priority form. Mm -hmm. So what the F-bar is, is there's no tax being paid with the F-bar. It's a form where you say, okay, I have bank accounts in these foreign countries with these banks. Here is the name of the bank. Here is the account number. And here is the maximum balance I had at any time during the year. Right. And you send it into the Department of Treasury um, every, every year by June 30th. There's, like I said, no tax to be paid. And you're reporting the highest maximum balance. Right. And to figure out if you need to file the form or not, you look at all your foreign accounts. Mm -hmm. And if the balance of those foreign accounts in total right. was more than $10,000 at any time during the year, right. you have to file a form. So under 10, you don't have to file yes, at all? Yes, but you have to watch out because if the balance exceeded 10,000, when you look at all the accounts together for even one day, right. um, you'll have to file. When, when we talk about examples later on, we're going to talk about a very common example where I may have wired money to a foreign account 
to, to buy a property or to help somebody out. So it may have gone from, it may have been $1,000 and it may have gone, have gone up to $100,000 or $15,000 for two days. Right. In that case, you need to file the FBAR. And the reason why the FBAR filing is so important is, is the penalties for not filing the FBAR are really severe. If the IRS believes that you willfully didn't file the FBAR, mm. the penalty is the greater of half the value of the account wow. or $100,000. Wow. Okay, so some really enormous penalties. Yeah. Um, that should be a wake-up call for should everyone. Be, it should be a wake-up call for everybody. Uh, now, go the, ahead. the point is over here that uh, even you're putting it separately out. This is going to the Department of Treasury. Treasury, correct. But you have to still state it in your tax returns? E excellent point. On your, t on your Form 1040 that we're filing right okay. now, on the Schedule B, which is your interest in dividend income, there's a question, do you have a foreign bank right. account, yes or no? If yes, what country? And if yes, are you required to file the FBAR, yes or no? Yes. Okay. And another big misconception is, generally speaking, when you file your Form 1040, mm -hmm. you only have to attach that Schedule B if your interest or dividend income is $1,500 or more. Okay. So let's say I only had $100 of income from, from a local bank account. I wouldn't be required to schedule, file, include Schedule B with my tax return. But there's an exception to that rule that says if I have a foreign bank account, I'm required to attach that Schedule B. So it's a very good point. A lot it's of for times, uh, foreign banks don't send you your um, Most documents. of the time, they won't. Right. If it's under $50. Well, it, well U.S. banks will not <coughs> send you yeah. if it's less than $10. But a foreign right. bank is not going to send you a Form 1099. Right, right. So it's a, it's a big problem. So the onus is onto on the tax file? Exactly. Put that out. Okay. Exactly. And many people just think it's a few dollars. I'm not going to worry about it. But you've yeah. got at least, even if you don't have to file the FBAR, you need to check the box yes, mm. that I have a foreign bank account. Right. I want to come back to you later, Vinny, mm -hmm. but I'm going to talk to Melinda over here. And I know that you, as a tax attorney, uh, you really have been doing a lot of FBAR, you know, uh, uh, sorry, offshore voluntary compliance, uh, and a lot of cases that you've done. And this is an IRS program. So throw some light on this for our viewers. Sure. Um, January 9th of this year, 2012, IRS launched its third voluntary, voluntary disclosure initiative in the offshore arena. Okay. Um, there's a couple of changes from a program that was of, in effect for 2011, but I'll just focus on the 2012 program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what it essentially entails is you come forward, okay, you enter the program, you consult with Vinay, myself, you talk about the issues involved. Right. You agree to amend your returns for the program years, which for the 2012 program are the eight years immediately prior to 2012, so 2004 through 2011. You come forward, you amend your returns with any um, offshore income that you hadn't reported previously. Okay. You also include copies of the original returns that you filed, you file amended FBARs or original FBARs, the forms that Vinay was actually just discussing. Mm -hmm. So if you have filed them for certain years, you amend them for the accounts that weren't included. Right. You agree to pay an offshore penalty. Now, this is actually the big um, issue that most taxpayers have. The offshore penalty is now 27.5 percent right. of the highest aggregate balances for the program year. So Renee, what that means is, between 2004 and 2011, IRS aggregates all your accounts, looks at the highest year, and takes 27.5% of the account balances as an offshore penalty, which, you know, of course, upsets a lot of taxpayers and a lot of clients that I've dealt with are not happy with that situation, of course. So it's the... It's the amended returns, it's the original returns and FBARs. It's that 27.5% penalty right. of the highest aggregate year. Right. It's also a 20% accuracy related penalty, which is on the underreported tax, mm -hmm. okay, plus interest, plus full cooperation with the IRS process as it goes forward. Right. So 